And our first scripture reading this morning is Haggai chapter 1, verses 1 through 15. Haggai 1, 1 to 15. In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Sheltiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say the time has not yet come for the Lord's house to be built. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but have harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build the house, so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You expected much, but you see it turned out to be little. What you brought home I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty? Because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with his own house. Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew and the earth its crops. I called for a drought on the fields and the mountains, on the grain, the new wine, the oil, and whatever the ground produces, on men and cattle, and on the labor of your hands. Then Zerubbabel, son of Sheltiel, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the whole remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the message of the prophet Haggai, because the Lord their God had sent him. And the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message of the Lord to the people. I am with you, declares the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Sheltiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of the whole remnant of the people. They came and began work on the house of the Lord, Almighty their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of King Darius. And our second reading is Malachi chapter 3, verses 6 through 12. Malachi 3, 6 through 12. I, the Lord, do not change, so you, O descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your forefathers, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? Will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how do we rob you? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have enough room for it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops and the vines in your fields and will not cast and the vines in your fruit will not cast their fields will not cast your fruit, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. So today we reach week five on our seven-week journey through the book of Malachi, prophetic book written 450 BC, last of the books of the Old Testament. And so people often talk about the period from when Malachi was written until the time prophecies were given to the parents of John the Baptist and, and Jesus to Mary as the silent period when God didn't speak. Probably God did speak, none of it's recorded in, in writing for us. And so we've seen the book itself has a very, very simple structure. It's built around a sequence of six disputation speeches. There was never a situation where the people were here and God was here and they had a back and forth, but it's the scenario was set up that God is reading the heart of the people and he's interacting with them. And what we've seen is ultimately it's a love story of God calling his people back to, back to faithfulness. So remember the point of the first dispute, it all started with this, the message that God truly loves his people. That's the foundation for everything we see in scripture. Point of the second was that the people were at best half-hearted in their service to the Lord. Point of the third one was the people were covenant breakers who ruthlessly sought to fulfill their heart's desires. Purpose of the fourth one last week is that God is a God of justice and regardless of how the world looks around you right now, God is going to put it right in the end and that we can we can count on that. And so today when we come to the fifth dispute, which really links all the way back to the second one, because remember the second one, the denunciation of the clergy had to do with the priests were taking bribes, the people were bringing defective offerings, and basically it was just a whole, whole big fiasco, and this kind of ties into to that. But it comes down to this, misplaced priorities. So looking at this dispute about the withholding, withholding of, of tithes, We're kind of in the same situation as we were with the second dispute, because when we read the second dispute about defective offerings and would you offer that to the governor, 
it's kind of hard for us on the surface to look at condemnations of corrupt priests and defective sacrifices and wonder, well, what, what, what does that mean to us today? We're in 2020. We don't bring livestock to church with us. So we had to go back and look at the context of it. And once we saw what it meant in its context, we were able to pull the principles out. Well, it's the same, it's the same for, for today. To understand really what this passage is talking about, we have to go back to the original context and think, what was the message actually there? In general, when you look at any of the errors that creep into the church today, and really for most of church history, they inevitably come from a lack of knowledge of the Old Testament. The New Testament just didn't appear out of nowhere, but it really kind of is the appendix to the, to the Old Testament. And so then when we start to look at specifics, a lot of the things that go wrong, especially in matters of day-to-day Christian life and practice, come from misunderstanding things in the Old Testament, and especially things that were at the national level within the context of covenant, and taking them and applying to the individual. So it's so easy to look at this person and say, well, look at how well-to-do they are, and their health is good. They're under God's blessings, because the Bible says so. I can read that in Deuteronomy. Or this one here is suffering such pain and adversity, so they must be sinners because they're under God's curses. And that's none of that is is the case. So we're going to take a look at the backdrop to today's passage, and as we see, it's going to pull out something that really is quite, quite different to how we picture these topics. And so remember, the disputation speech has four basic parts to it. There's the assertion, which is the charge leveled against another party. So I have this against you is the idea there. Then the other party gets their response where they can question the person with the accusations. The person bringing the accusations gets to provide the response to that. And then because the context of this is calling us to covenant faithfulness to the Lord and teaching us lessons about God, it ultimately comes to an implication. What does that mean for us, the people, the people of God? Remember that this is balanced out. Three of the complaints are complaints the people had against God, something we often, many Christians cringe about. How can you complain about God? Well, it's, it's, there, it's there in the Bible, but there's a process in that. So half the complaints were the people against God and God answering them. How gracious and loving of him to do that, not just squash them, open up the earth rain down fire and brimstone. But he, he listened to their complaints, and he understood, and he, he brought them answers. But there were the three complaints from the Lord as well. So when we look at today, there's a little bit of a back and forth that goes on in the middle. The assertion starts with this in verses 6 and the first part of verse 7. It's from the Lord himself. And so his assertion is that the people that have turned away from him have to return. So then the question Israel has in response to that is, okay, well then how shall we return? But notice that God doesn't doesn't respond to their first question. He just brings a second assertion against them, which is on the heels of the first assertion. And so he says to them, you are certainly robbing me, which brings about a question back from Israel. Well, how? How are we robbing you? And he just simply says, tithes and offerings. That's the answer. And then when we pull it all together, the implication is the robbery is taking the form of shortchanging tithes, but if God receives his due, he'll turn he will in turn grant such abundance to the nation of Israel that they'll be blessed and the whole world will see it and they'll be, they'll be famous for it. So if we're not going to go horribly wrong, and it's real easy to go, go wrong, um, the, if I was to ask you, if you watch TV ministries, what do you need to do to get rich? Pour all your money into the TV ministry, right? The more you give them, the richer you're going to get. And if you don't get rich in return, it's your fault. Bad you, you don't have enough faith. So give more money, give more. Why? Because if you give enough money to the ministry, then the heavens will open and God will shower down his blessings on you. Well, that comes from the past we read today. So how are we to understand all this? We need to understand, first of all, what exactly is a tithe? What was it? Secondly, what is the problem that is being dealt with through Malachi here because the tithes were missing, because they weren't being brought to Jerusalem? Thirdly, what is, in fact, the blessing that is promised So when God talks about opening the windows of heaven and pouring down blessings on the people so that their storehouses will be overflowing, what exactly is the blessing promised? And then finally, how does this passage apply to us living here in the New Covenant some 2,500-ish years later? So the thing we should note is, remember the book itself opened with God reminding the people, I have loved you. So here, this opens first with a call to repentance. Notice in verse 6, For I, the Lord, all capitalized, for I, Jehovah, your God, do not change. In other words, God is faithful. He's steadfast. He's a rock. You can depend on him. Kind of sounds like the Psalms, right? Our rock, our redeemer, our fortress, our high tower, our shelter. 
We take refuge under his wings. All the different analogies are there. That God is faithful. God does not change. O sons of Jacob. How interesting he doesn't call them sons of Israel. And you see this this stream of election going through there because you've got Abraham was the father of Isaac who was the father of Jacob. And so hitting that far down the chain, Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, and that's where the name of the nation came from, God is really focusing in on, I don't change, you are my covenant people. And so because I don't change, I am faithful to my side of the covenant, you haven't been consumed. You're still there, he's saying. Then he continues, verse 7, from the days of your fathers, so not just literally their fathers, that's true, but going all the way back to the conquest of the promised land, go step back into the Exodus. You have turned aside from my statutes and you've not kept them. So here's the call to repentance. Return to me and I will return to you. And what's the confidence in that? Because the Lord God doesn't change. The Lord is faithful to his covenant. So return to him. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord. Some of that language should seem familiar to us. We could go back two sermon series to when we went through James. And in James 1.17, we read, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. God doesn't change. I, the Lord, do not change. Or how about Hebrews? Hebrews 13.8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. So God just doesn't change. So what about this call based on, founded on the unchangeableness of God to return to him, the call to repentance. Well, we have those too in the New Testament, James 4.8. Draw near to God, exact same language as we get in Malachi. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Return to me and I will return to you. It's the same, it's the same thing. So draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. So it's that idea of repentance. The Greek word for repent is metanoia. It's a change in mind. It's a new way of thinking. So this all comes from this call to repentance. So what we need to do now is think about, okay, this tithe that the people are robbing God of, what exactly is this? So if I was to ask you and you were to say one-tenth of the income, okay, well, sort of, yeah, that's mathematically correct, but we need to look a little bit more closely at this. So all of the passages that laid out principles related to the tithe came from the five books of Moses. So in other words, it was all put into place in the law of the Old Covenant before the people even crossed the Jordan into the Promised Land. So we go back to Leviticus 27.30, and God declares his ownership over the tithe, over one-tenth. Thus all the tithe of the land, of the seed of the land, of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's, it is holy to the Lord. Remember, it's all Lord, the Lord's. He created the whole universe. The whole thing belongs to him. So they don't really own it when they move in. But what he's saying is, when I give you the land and you move in, take your 90% and do whatever you want with it. Just make sure you keep my commandments. But one-tenth of your land and what it produces, the work of your hands, that is consecrated to me. That part, that part is mine. And then in Deuteronomy 12, again, looking forward to the settling of the promised land, but you shall seek the Lord at the place which the Lord your God shall choose from all your tribes. We know that that was Jerusalem. We know that's where the temple was established. So looking ahead, God is saying there's going to be a central place of worship. And so that's going to be where the Lord is going to dwell. And there you shall come. And when you come, you're going to bring your burnt offerings and your sacrifices, your tithes, contributions of your hand your votive offerings, your freewill offerings, the firstborn of your herd and of your flock. So that's where all this is going to be, all this is going to be brought. So we could roughly think of this as a flat rate income tax if we want, but there's actually a lot more to it than that. So let's think about the settling of the land momentarily. Joshua 11.23, a few years back, we went through the Joshua story, and so that was the conquest of the land promised to Abraham, the covenant land. So there's our There's our Israel there, Jordan River's there, people crossed over, so we saw that story. But at about the midpoint of the book of Joshua in chapter 11, we read this. So Joshua took the whole land, the whole entire promised land, and according to all the Lord has spoken to Moses, so the allotments of land were all divvied up on paper, I guess parchment, right? Sheep, skin, whatever it was, divvied up on paper well before this. According to all that the Lord had spoken to Moses, Joshua gave it for an inheritance to Israel according to the divisions by their tribes, and thus the land had rest from war. And so we don't need to go through the geography, but you can see all the different tribes and their little bits of their land that's carved out. So if you were to do a count, what you would find is you'd find 11 tribes here. But how many tribes were there in total? There were 12 tribes. One tribe doesn't have any land, and that one tribe is Levi. 
on a side note, notice Edom down here. Remember the descendants of Esau? Remember those are the pesky neighbors who every year when the harvest came in, they would come in, steal it, and go back to where they came from. And that was part of the reason that the people were suffering and didn't have enough to, to eat. They kept coming in the back door and, and robbing them. So we see 12, there's 12 tribes, but only 11 show up on the map. The tribe of Levi was not granted a single parcel of land. But it doesn't mean that God ignored them. It doesn't mean they didn't have an inheritance. They had a special inheritance. And we see that in Numbers, Numbers 18. So the inheritance for the Levites is this. The 11 tribes were given what their land was going to be. But in Numbers 18, we read, Then the Lord spoke to Aaron, Now behold, I myself have given you charge of my offerings, even all, notice underlined for emphasis, even all the holy gifts of the sons of Israel, I have given them to you as a portion and to your sons as a perpetual allotment. So that's the tribe of Levi from which the priests come and the temple servants. Then verse 19, all, again, underlined for emphasis, all the offerings of the holy gifts which the sons of Israel offer to the Lord I have given to you and your sons and your daughters with you as a perpetual allotment. It is an everlasting covenant of salt before the Lord to you and your descendants with you. Then the Lord said to Aaron, you shall have no inheritance in the land, so none of the land is theirs. They don't get land. You shall have no inheritance in their land, nor own any portion among them. I am your portion and your inheritance among the sons of Israel. If we're really thinking right and we really know and understand the Lord, he as our portion and inheritance is better than any land or riches that we could have. So they really are more blessed than all of the other 11 tribes. So I am your portion, your inheritance among the sons of Israel. But you can't eat platitudes, right? You can't dress yourself in well wishes and blessings. So where does all that come from? Next verse. And to the sons of Levi, behold, I have given all, emphasis, all the tithe in Israel for an inheritance in return for their service, which they perform, the service of the tent of the meeting. So notice that God has given all of the tithes and offerings from all of the 11 other tribes to the tribe of Levi. That's their inheritance. That's theirs. They don't get land. They get that carved off the top. So there's a sequence here. We saw God declared his ownership of the tithe. So he said, that tithe, it's mine, I own it. And then he said to the Levites, and I'm giving it to you, it's yours. You don't really hear that said too often, and yet it's, it's right there in, not black and white, but dark blue and light blue. So how are these tithes distributed? What's the chain? And what's that logistical chain? Well, step one. Step one in the distribution of tithes is that the people all throughout the land, once they're settled, each household brings, because if you're a whole family and you've got a ranch or you've got a farm, each one's not plucking their choice sheep. The family is bringing its tithe. Each household is. So the tithes are brought to the temple at the appointed times. So Deuteronomy 14, speaking to the nation collectively, God says, you shall surely tithe all the produce from what you sow, which comes out of the field every year, and you shall eat in the presence of the Lord your God at the place where he chooses to establish his name, the tithe of your grain, your new wine, your oil, the firstborn of your herd and your flock, in order that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. And so if the distance is so great for you that you're not able to bring the tithe, since the place where the Lord your God chooses to set his name is too far away from you when the Lord your God blesses you, then you shall exchange it for money and bind the money in your hand and go to the place which the Lord your God chooses. Remember one of the things that Jesus did early in his ministry was he went in and he turned over the tables of the money changers and cleared out the temple. So the idea was if you live a far distance off, you can't really bring tons of grain and herds of livestock with you all the way to Jerusalem. So what you do is you sell it, you bring the money, and then you use the money to buy by your supplies, by your supplies there. Now, notice the first thing that happens with your money, with your tithe, when you arrive at Jerusalem at the appointed time. And you may spend the money for whatever your heart desires. Wait a minute, what? The tithe you brought, you can spend it for whatever your heart desires? Well, there must be limitations. What does it say? For oxen or sheep or wine or strong drink? Wait, liquor? You can buy liquor with your tithe? So, oxen or sheep or wine or strong drink or whatever your heart desires and there you shall eat in the presence of the Lord your God and rejoice you and your household. Also you shall not neglect the Levite who is in your town for he has no portion or inheritance among you. So notice the first thing that happens with the tithe when it gets there. They have a big party. The nation of Israel throws a giant party and they eat and drink and be merry and celebrate to the Lord. You know, what does that say about somber, downcast churches where everybody is stern and solemn and God is saying no. I've given you stuff to be a blessing to you. Take it and celebrate. Because every time you celebrate and rejoice with what I've given you, you're glorifying me. You're expressing your thanksgiving. And then 
the Levites, don't forget them because they've got nothing to bring to the party. You know, maybe a BYOB party, but the Levites don't have any B to bring to the party. So share with them. So it all starts with that, a big, big, giant celebration and a party. That's step one. Well, people can only eat and drink so much, no matter how gluttonous they are, so most of it's still going to be left over. So that brings us to step two in the distribution change, in the distribution chain. So the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Moreover, you shall speak to the Levites. We're back to Numbers 18 and the Levites. Moreover, you shall speak to the Levites and say to them, When you take from the sons of Israel the tithe which I have given you from them for your inheritance. So step one, everybody brings their tithe to Jerusalem. And there's a big, big, giant party that's had. Once the party wraps up, everything that's not consumed, which is going to be most of it again, because you can't eat so much, that then is in mass given to the tribe of the Levites. So now they take this, it's in one big collective pile, and what they're commanded to do is from that, present an offering from it. So right there, when you take from the sons of Israel the tithe which I've given you from them for your inheritance, then you shall present an offering from it to the Lord, a tithe of the tithe. And your offering shall be reckoned to you as the grain from the threshing floor or the full produce from the wine vat. So you shall present an offering to the Lord from your tithes, which you received from the sons of Israel. And from it, you shall give to the Lord, give the Lord's offering to Aaron the priest. Out of all your gifts, you shall present every offering due to the Lord and from all the best of them, the sacred part of them. So then what's happening is the, the pile is there. The Levites are going through while it's in the pile and they're selecting out the best 10% of it. And then that goes to the temple and that's the Lord's part. And the rest is their inheritance. That's their livelihood. So then you shall say to them, when you have offered from the best of it, then the rest shall be reckoned to the Levites as the product of the threshing floor, as the product of the wine vat. And you may eat it anywhere, you and your households, for it is your compensation in return for your service in the tent of the meeting. So we look at the math. The math is pretty interesting when we consider all of this. See, there's even fractions up there. How do you like that? I think nobody likes fractions. So if we start with this, 11 out of the 12 tribes got all of the land. So what does that mean for the 12th tribe? If we're looking at a proportional balancing, what that means is for each tribe of their land, one twelfth of it really should have gone to the Levites. One twelfth is 8.3%. So think of it this way. Your household got an allotment of 100 acres. Of your 100 acres, 8.3 acres really should have been for the Levites. That would be their land, so that when you add it up over the whole entire nation, they're getting their 1 12th share proportionally based on population. So to begin with, and again, it was all the Lord's land. It all belonged to God. But in terms of your 100 acres, 8.3 of it really should have been given to one of your tribes, one of your brothers who has, who has nothing. They would be destitute if it wasn't for that, that bit that you're tending to. Now, remember, the Lord claimed his ownership of 10%. That was the tithe. But then we've seen the Lord took the tithe, which he said, it's mine, I own it. And he said, and I'm giving it to you, the Levites. It's all yours, the whole entire thing. But give me a tenth of it. So when we look at what happens to the tithe itself, 90% of all the tithes went to the Levites. 10% of all the tithes went to the Lord. So if we look at this as gross national product, 9% of the gross national product ended up going to the Levites. So it's like a bonus, right? 8.3% proportionally would have been what they should have got, but they got 9%. God gave them a bonus. So they ended up doing better than everyone else, and they didn't even have to work the land for it. Not that they weren't working around the clock in the temple. And then the Lord only got 1% that was produced by the land. So it's really interesting when you break this down, the part the Lord is actually getting in the end out of what he claimed, it only ends up being 1, 1%. So... So what's, what's, the, what's the problem? Well, there's the obvious, obvious surface problem. By the people withholding tithes, which was part of the covenant, they were disobedient. So that's right off the top the obvious problem. They were robbing God because Malachi 3, 8, will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. You say, how have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. So that part was carved out. That's... that's the obvious part, but there's a deeper underlying problem here. So our first scripture reading this morning was Haggai chapter 1. And Haggai was one of the two prophets along with Zechariah who prophesied at the start of the return from exile. So we're talking probably about 50 or so years before what we're reading in, in Malachi. And we see the beginning of the problems back there. Mal or Haggai 1.4. The people had returned to the land at that point. And 
they're told this, is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies desolate? So the first thing they did is they built their houses. Okay, fine, you need shelter. But they did their fancy kitchens with granite countertops and nice islands and pot lights and all the other stuff, or the best you could do that in ancient Israel. And the temple was sitting off there in a heap. And so their houses got better and better and better, and the temple just sat there in a heap. So God says, you've sown much, but you harvest little. You eat, but there's not enough to be satisfied. You drink, but there's not enough to become drunk. You put on clothing, but no one's warm enough. And he who earns earns wages to put in a purse with holes in it. Thus says the Lord, consider your ways, go up to the mountains, bring wood and rebuild the temple that I may be pleased with it and be glorified, says the Lord. So the lack of giving it was not the problem. It was a symptom of the problem. The problem itself was self-love. The people loved themselves and were concerned with their own comfort and everything else came second. And we're good at justifying that. So that was the underlying problem. So what's the curse? Because to understand what the blessing is, we've got to understand what the curse is. Well, let's remember Malachi 3 today is not the first time we've encountered curses. We go back a couple weeks to Malachi 2. And now this commandment is for you, O priests. If you do not listen, if you do not take heart to give honor to my name, says the Lord of hosts, then I will send the curse upon you and I will curse your blessings. And indeed, I've cursed them already because you're not taking it to heart. So along the way, we look back at Deuteronomy and saw that for the nation of Israel, once they entered the land, if they were faithful to the covenant, God would pour blessings out on them. If they were unfaithful to the covenant, God would put curses on them. They have collectively been unfaithful to the covenant, so they're under, they're under curses. So then we read today, you are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation. So going back to the opening week, remember some of the problems they were facing? Agriculture hadn't adequately rebounded after the exile. Drought, pests, and blight had long hampered economic recovery. In fact, we can tie that back to Haggai, where our first reading this morning, God had said, because you're neglecting my temple and you're worrying about your own houses, you've got drought, you've got pestilence, you've got famine. And so poverty was widespread. So that's the curse. The heart of the curse is the land's not producing. There's drought, there's pestilence, and there's famine. So in the backdrop of that, we come to the blessing. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house, and test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. So contrary to the televangelists who are saying, keep sending us money and eventually you're going to get rich because God's going to open the windows of, of heaven. Every time you see reference to the windows of heaven or heaven's opening up in the Old Testament, anyone you take a guess what that's talking about? Rain. Going all the way back to the flood. So what, what God is literally saying to them now if you quit robbing me, if you fulfill your part of the covenant, which you've been violating, I'm going to bring rain back. You're not eating food right now because of the drought. Well, you return to me, I'll return to you. The heavens are going to open, the rain's going to come down, and you're going to have crops beyond your wildest imagination. It's a promise to restore crops. The other problem was the locusts and the pests that were coming along and gobbling up, even the Edomites, you call them pests. So then the next verse, then I will rebuke the devourer for you, whether it's locusts or Edomites. I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it may not destroy the fruits of the ground, nor will your vine in the field cast its grapes, says the Lord of hosts. And all the nations will call you blessed, for you shall be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. And so what this is saying is God is faithful. If the nation repents and lives faithfully according to the covenant, God's going to reverse all the curses that are there now, restore his blessings, and as a result, the nation is going to be a testimony to all the other nations. Douglas Stewart in his commentary on Malachi talking about this passage says this, it does not constitute a promise that individual believers become prosperous if they tithe. So next time you hear somebody on TV saying that, you will know that they are horribly taking this out of context, maybe innocently, maybe intentionally. The actual kind of blessing promise is a combination of abundant rain and freedom from crop, press. it's, uh, crop pests. It's a literal undoing of the current curses. And so when he says use as a synecdote, it's kind of representative for restoration of blessings of all sorts. All the blessings will come back. And Stuart is right to note, and we'll come back to this, that there is an eschatological and end times overtone to this whole entire promise. I mean, that's something we remember. We get foretastes of the promises of God in this life, but the fullness of the promises are going to be delivered when Jesus returns. So then... This is a passage about Old, Test or Old Covenant obligations for the nation of Israel living within the promised land. Address the nation as a whole expecting, and expect the nation as a whole to respond. And the blessings and curses were always at the national level, never individual. That accounted for why wicked people prospered and righteous people suffered because it wasn't a one-to-one -one personal correspondence. So what can we take away from this? Well, we should quickly note the similarities with New Testament giving 
and the differences with New Testament giving. So as far as the similarities, there are very, very few passages in the New Testament that actually deal with the topic. 2 Corinthians 9 is the, is the fullest one. Now, we understand the backdrop to this. If you've read through Paul's letters, and you see it mentioned in Acts, if you read through Paul's letters, what you find is he has this ongoing offering he's trying to get together to take to the church in Jerusalem because the Christians in Jerusalem are suffering financially. And so Paul is trying to get all the other churches to give to helping those people. And so in that context, Paul says, Now this I say, he who sows sparingly shall also reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully shall also reap bountifully. Let each one do just as he has purposed in his heart. So giving comes from the heart. It's a matter of conscience. Not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every, for every good deed. And you can kind of see the echoing of the language from Malachi there, the idea that the things we need in life, that God will provide that for us. Make sure we're taking care of those around us, and God will, God will take care of us. So again, Stuart, in his commentary on this passage on Malachi, says, Tithing per se is not a Christian requirement, not a stipulation of the new covenant, but financial giving positively is, and there is a connection between generosity and reward, says the apostle, just as Malachi 3, 8 to 12 also implies. And then he goes on to note that giving is one of the five aspects of Christian worship. So there's prayer, there's praise, there's giving, there's hearing the word, and then there's communion, the Lord's Supper. And Christian worship is the basic, initial, and permanent response of the believer to God. I mean, ultimately, that's what we're called to do, is to worship God. As the first question in the Westminster Catechism says, what is the chief end or purpose of man? To glorify God and enjoy him forever. Presbyterian theology there, Reformed theology, biblical theology. So those are similarities, but what about the differences? Well, we start to go wrong when we start to make these wrong equations between the Old and New Testament. So, for example... It's wrong to equate Israel to the local church. We here as a local congregation are not equivalent to Israel. We are just a local group of believers. The best analogy would be we could be one of the households or tribes. The better comparison would be, notice mathematically I got the approximately equal sign because there's differences in continuity between Israel and the church. But we should be looking at discussions of Israel in the Old Testament as being an analogy to the church on the whole. So when we think about one of the key differences... If we were looking at the giving in the Old Testament, 90% of it was to support the tribe that had nothing. They would have been homeless and hungry if that was the case. And the rest went to the ministry of the temple because worship was centralized then. Remember when Jesus was asked by the Samaritans, so tell us, where is the proper place to worship? Is it up in the mountains where our people say, or is it here in Jerusalem like your people say? And Jesus said, the answer is C, none of the above. Because a time is coming when you're going to worship God in spirit and truth, because God is spirit, so he must be worshipped in spirit and truth. In other words, worship will take place everywhere. So the local church is one ministry that needs support, but there's parachurch ministries. So for example, there's things like Campus Crusade for Christ and Navigators who go out into different institutions and bring the gospel and ministry to people there. there there's missions. Um, you look at giving in the New Testament, and it's all missions-focused, giving to, giving to people in other places. There's teaching ministries, like Ligonier Ministry, for example, good Reformed teaching there. There is aid and relief ministries, like our shoeboxes, like World Vision, like Compassion, where practical day-to-day -day help and also the gospel goes to people around the world. There's ministry self-support. Think about the Apostle Paul. He had no financial connection with any church, nor would he allow it. And he said, I have every right to receive funding from you, but I'm not going to take it. So what did he do? He worked for himself. He went, he worked, he raised enough money for all his ministry supplies, for his travel and for everything else. And then I've got etc. because the list goes on and on and on. So we've got to look at the totality of the kingdom of God. The second difference, and this is a big one, is we don't have a clergy class that hasn't really filtered through in a, lot of, in, in a lot of Protestant denominations. There still is this idea that there's the clergy and there's the rest. still remember one time at, at Wortley in, in London as the pastor was introducing someone else and he introduced this man as a choice servant of God. Well, that's ridiculous. We're all choice servants of God. There's not the higher servants and the lower servants. It doesn't matter what each one of us does. We're equivalent in the service of the kingdom. It doesn't matter your education, whether you're on TV or whatever. We're we're equivalent, and that is because there is no priesthood anymore, even though it keeps creeping back in and there's all fancy robes and all that other stuff that makes it look like it's Old Testament. Well, it's, it's on the back wall, but instead of looking at the back wall there, remember, we are a royal priesthood. Every single one of us is a priest to God. 
a holy nation, a people for God's own possessions, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who's called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. So how do we do that? Well, the first, first paragraph we read this morning in Our World Belongs to God really fit with this. It's the idea that the totality of our lives, whether it's finances, whether it's the work of our hands, whether it's our skills, our gifts, all these things collectively are all meant for service for the Lord. So Romans 12, I urge you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God to present your bodies. Remember, we're priest and offering. Present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable God, which is your spiritual servant of wor- service of worship. And since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let each exercise them accordingly. If prophecy, according to the proportion of his faith, if service in his serving, he who teaches in his teaching, he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Notice that giving in there is a is a spiritual gift. And so it's a matter of each one of us needs to look at in the totality of it, what can we do with what God has given us, be it money, be it time, be it whatever, to be of benefit to the church, to be of benefit to one another. Because when we pull all this together, we should be having parties to celebrate the Lord's goodness, and we should be doing all that we can to glorify God and one another. So as we bring this to a close, today's reminder of the perfect faithfulness of God, because remember, that's where it started with, coupled with a call for us to turn to God with our whole hearts and to serve him faithfully with all that we have and all that we are, really dovetails nicely with today, the fourth Sunday of Advent, the Sunday of peace. So the title of this morning's message was Priority Check, and this reminds us that we need to examine ourselves and look at not just, am I signing off the right amount of check, but my whole entire life, what am I doing for the Lord? And can I really look at the totality of my life, all that I have and all that I am, And can I say I'm living as God called me to? Malachi 3, 6, For I, the Lord, do not change. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Same call Jesus gives us in Matthew 10. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and he who does not take up his own cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. From a more positive perspective, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, So whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, sounds like a big party at the temple in Jerusalem, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. And so we'll close with this. Remember that ultimately this is looking forward to end times, and it's a hint of the promise of peace that is fulfilled in and by Christ. The passage wrapped up with this, And all the nations will call you blessed, for you shall be a delightful land, says the Lord. Think about John 14.1, which actually part of that was in our reading this morning for the candle lighting. Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. He who has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me shall be loved by my Father, and I will love him and will disclose myself to him. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. And in the midst of that passage of love and peace and fellowship with God, what do we have in the middle of it? Obey the commandments. Live as God called us to live. And so our song of response this morning is a song that reminds us that Jesus came to bring peace and reconciliation with God, and he came to bring all the blessings of God so that we can enjoy God for eternity. And it's We Three Kings. So let's stand and join together singing We Three Kings.